Ukraine was the second largest republic in the Soviet Union after Russia. It was Russia's main trade partner. Ukraine was in many ways the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. After the counter-revolution overthrew the governments in the Soviet Union, in Russia, in Ukraine, Ukraine became independent. And for the last, you know, all the time since 1991, all the time, almost 30 years, the U.S. has been pumping in billions of dollars through the so-called National Endowment for Democracy, other non-governmental organizations. And then in 2013, in the fall of 2013, when the Russian government, I think, was preoccupied with the Sochi Olympics, the Winter Olympics, and there was lots of you know international protests coming and they were worried that the Olympics would be disrupted. These protests began in the middle of Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. It was called Maidan, meaning the Maidan Square protests. And they went on for November and December and January. And then in early February, mid-February, really, a deal was struck between the opposition forces to the Yanukovych government, who were pro-European, pro-EU, pro-NATO, and the Yanukovych government, which was a government that wasn't pro-Russian, but sought neutrality between East and West and vowed that Ukraine would never become a part of NATO. They came to a deal with Yanukovych and the Russians were at the table and the Germans were at the table and the French were at the table and the U.S. was at the table, but as an observer. And there was an agreement that Yanukovych would pull the police out of the center of Kiev, that he would call early elections in Ukraine, meaning allowing the opposition to replace him as the president. He would devolve authority from the center of Ukraine to the regions, which was another demand of the opposition. And he signed that agreement with international observers watching on February 21st, 2014. On February 22nd, 2014, fascist-led militias stormed the parliament, dispersed the parliament, tried to kill the president. He fled for his life, and they created a neo-Nazi regime in Ukraine at that time. The whole eastern part of the country speaks Russian, was historically part of Russia. I mean, in 1625, Kiev was a capital of Russia. I mean, it's always been historically part of Russia, at least the eastern part of Ukraine. They banned the Russian language, and they made it clear that they were going to join NATO. Now, at that moment, the U.S. thought, and by the way, McCain, John McCain, Hillary Clinton spokespersons, you know, they were all in Maidan. They were handing out cookies to the protesters. The U.S. government, both parties, joint operation, all the U.S. media cheering them on, saying this was the greatest day for Ukrainian democracy when the fascists stormed the parliament and dispersed the government. And they thought, OK, we have Russia by the throat. And it was then that Putin said, look, we're going to let the people in Crimea, who are almost all Russian speakers and ethnically Russian, we're going to let them have a referendum about whether under these circumstances they want to reaffix Crimea to Russia. And they had a referendum in June 2014, and 95% of the people voted, yes, we prefer to be with Russia. Crimea had always been part of Russia. It was only given to Ukraine in 1954 by Nikita Khrushchev when Ukraine and Russia were part of the same country, the Soviet Union. And so when Putin did that, the United States accused Russia of seizing Ukraine because that referendum took place in Crimea where the people voted to associate with Russia rather than Ukraine. The other part of that equation that's very important for people who don't know enough about this situation to understand is Crimea was the most important naval base for the Soviet Union. And after the Soviet Union collapsed, after the Soviet Federation or Union broke up, there was an agreement between the Ukrainian, now independent Ukrainian government and the Russian government that the Black Sea Fleet, the Russian Black Sea Naval Base, the largest military installation that Russia has, would remain part of Russia, even though Crimea was technically a part of Ukraine. So when the U.S.-led fascist coup d'etat took place, Vladimir Putin realized that the Russian primary biggest military base, the largest naval base, would now become a NATO base with nuclear missiles pointed at Russia. That was too much. 
And so then and only then did Russia go forward and allow this referendum to take place. And since then, since then, the United States and all of the politicians and the media have labeled Putin to be and Russia to be the aggressor. But that's the actual context. And so Russia now feels that Ukraine, which was the exact, you know, planes through which Hitler invaded the Soviet Union in June 1941. What Putin is saying is this is a red line for us. We are not going to allow Ukraine, formerly our biggest ally, the second biggest republic in the Soviet Union, to be used by NATO to prepare for an invasion of Russia. That's not going to happen. That's why we are now at the verge of a major power conflict between the U.S. and Russia. And the reason I wanted to give a little bit of this history is that the American people don't know about it. And they just think because they're told every day that Putin is bad, he's an autocrat, and Russia is an aggressor, when in fact, Putin, and in this case, Russia, are the victim of Western aggression. 